Good day, Jane. Thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me in person. Sure. Um, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and where you work and what you're doing uh, and perhaps then uh, some of the more interesting things you've worked on in your career and how you came to be where you are right now today. <laughs> it's a long story, I'm sure, but please share that with us. Uh, I'm Jane Bozarth and we're coming at you live today from Durham, North Carolina. Um, I have a degree in English, which at the time everyone said was a terrible, terrible idea. All my friends were majoring in business and now they are all bored and tired of whatever it is they ended up doing and I've had this great fun life. Uh, I was hired years ago because of the English degree with state government to be a literacy tutor. We had a number, I was at a hospital for developmentally disabled adults and we had a number of staff, they had a number of staff who over the years had become healthcare technicians and suddenly the state decided one day that these people needed to pass written tests to do their jobs. Written multiple mm -hmm. choice exams and there was no reading it to them, there was, there was no way around it. I think the rationale somewhere deep, deep down had to do with their needing to make notes. Hmm. about clients and about treatment plans and what have you but over the years they had all sort of worked this out amongst themselves to how the work would get done and the notes would get written but the state, mm -hmm. the state being what the state can be sometimes decided everyone had to take these written exams so I was hired to do that to get these people up to up to proficiency and reading enough sufficient they could pass the test and I did that for a while and then the state kind of lost interest but about the same time the state was losing interest our supervisory training coordinator quit and suddenly I was a supervisory training co uh -huh. coordinator all of a sudden and I think that's how a lot of people end up in this work is mm -hmm. that something happens or you're you're good at presenting and so suddenly you're a trainer so suddenly I was in that role um, she had been a very academic minded lecture oriented expert presenter type mm -hmm. and I didn't like any of the stuff she left behind so I figured the only way to do it better was to learn more about instructional design. We had an office subscription to Training Magazine mm -hmm. back when Ron Zemke was there. I think we probably got what was in, what ASTD's always called it T&D, haven't they? That's mm -hmm. their magazine. Right. So I had, I had those kind of resources. We had a library full of um, design books, and I suddenly don't remember the name. There was people who, who did an annual every year. Uh, there were lecturettes and there were games and there was experiential learning activities that came out every year in an annual and a big three ring binder. And after today, I'll remember the name of those. Yes, I, I, and we had a wall full of those. So I, I sort of learned by the seat of my pants. I sort of mm -hmm. learned as, as it evolved just by, by what, was, what, I, what I was able to get my hands on, what I was able to read because this was pre-internet. Mm -hmm. um, and there was really nobody else in the office who was interested in the way I was. A lot of them did technical training like first aid, which is very scripted and very mm -hmm. controlled, or they were nurses who were doing nursing care kinds of stuff. So I was the only one interested in this, and it was sort of seat of the pants. And eventually I found my way to a, um, a group of state government trainers who had assembled with the, the, uh, the, the mission, their self-developed mission was to stamp out crappy training. They ended up being the, the unit of interest in my dissertation years, years later. Mm -hmm. So between the community and self-study, I ended up learning more about design, learning more about making classroom training more interesting and engaging, uh, learning more about how to focus more on performance and active learning and not so much on people taking notes and passing written tests. Mm -hmm. so, so my interest evolved there. Also, I found a lot of the training that I was being sent to was just terribly boring and seemed to have no point. And... I wasn't going to be able to apply anything back at work, so I, I was sort of trial by fire in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Am I giving you the answers you want? Yes. <laughs> so where so where did you go from that particular right. job? So um, I eventually kind of outgrew that job. You know, they 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 had standard curriculum they wanted delivered. We had a huge churn. Uh, we always had new people. Our new higher orientation classes, we had 1,600 staff, and new higher orientation every month was 30 or 40 people, mm -hmm. every single month. Mostly at the lower classes, you know, the lower job entry classes, entry like, level. like trade people, uh, the healthcare tech, some nursing staff. Uh, we had three local hospitals, state hospitals, and they sort of were on a trolley 
between the three mm -hmm. hospitals all the time. So uh, the, between the churn and the, the realization that this was all I was ever really going to be able to do there, um, I, I did look for something else. And at the time, the training director of the North Carolina Justice Department job came open. And uh, that was going to mean a commute to Raleigh, which I was going to have to learn to, <laughs> to live with. Mm -hmm. But um, but it was it was going to be more of a director role. They did not have a training program, so it was a chance to go in and create what I wanted and put in what I wanted and and sort of get it from the ground up, which is wonderful. And I found out that's a way to have a job is when you can create it. Mm -hmm. And I had a manager who was very concerned about that deficit, and he really was on fire to get a trainer in. He wanted somebody who understood curriculum. He wanted somebody who knew how to build stuff. He wanted uh, we were going to be working with, with law enforcement, with the SBI, with the justice academies, with the attorneys and the paralegals at the main justice office. So he wanted somebody who could hold their own mm -hmm. <laughs> with that kind of audience. Yeah. And so you need somebody that's not going to be timid and easily sort of cowed by that. And I, mm -hmm. was, I was a very good fit for that job, as you can imagine. Um, and so I was able to sort of create, well, to create this program from the ground up, starting with onboarding and the supervisory stuff that I didn't really get to do as I was out growing the old job. And one day in a performance review, he said, this is state government and I don't have any money for raises this year. He said, but I can get you graduate work. If you want to go to graduate school, we have money for academic assistance. Mm -hmm. And he said, does that interest you? Would you like to pursue any of that? And so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, NC State was right up the road, but their whole master's program at the time was online. So I enrolled in that, and the state um, did reimburse the tuition for all of that. And it, it really opened my eyes to what I didn't know. It was like It was like... I had been thirsty for something, but I didn't know what it was. And to find out that there were real learning theories, to find out there were authors, to hear names getting dropped over and over, like mm -hmm. Maker and Pipe, like Zemke and Kramlinger, like um, like Bloom and like um, Vygotsky, and like uh, you know, just uh, just it, it was a whole new world that I had not really found out much about through the trade journals that I'd been depending on. Mm -hmm. And it, it really was like breathing better air. W one of my goals in pursuing the graduate work. Um, was that I had left this little training department where everybody was a trainer and everybody kind of spoke the same lingo. But when I went to justice, I was in an HR office and I was the only one. And I could tell sometimes when I would talk, I had three heads. <laughs> so I partly wanted to be able to better articulate mm -hmm. what I was saying about, well, we don't just want it to be fun. We don't just want to play games. There's a re I, I wasn't good at explaining that where I didn't really have to do it in my old job. So I found that the, the master's degree was very helpful in helping me become more articulate about my practice, more intentional about my practice, being able to justify decisions and doing things that I want to do, and being able to push back mm -hmm. when somebody was insisting we go do an awareness presentation on harassment for the 10,000th time. I could say, well, let's take, let's take a look at what's really going on. Why do we, what, what's going on and why do we need this? And what problems do we really need to fix? Mm -hmm. So the, the nature of the Justice Department is that it is helmed by the, uh, the Attorney General. And the Attorney General, as often as not, ends up running for governor. And when the Attorney General becomes governor, then most of the executive staff and the senior staff would go with him. Mm -hmm. So I had been working in the Easley administration. Um, and when he was elected governor, Roy Cooper came in. Most of the people I had worked for and with at the, at the senior levels left and went with easily, e either directly to the governor's office or they became agency secretaries. The boss who hired me became the state personnel director. And I was very happy working um, in the Cooper administration. I had, had good management there that, and they liked me and we all got along, but I was back in the place of feeling like I was kind of where I was ever going to get with that. You know, I was the, the attorneys and the, 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 um, the SBI and law enforcement. It was a smaller organization than I had been in at the hospital and I just kind of felt like it was leveling out for me there. However, the other thing that was going on was that my master's degree, as I said, was all online and that was my introduction to e-learning. Mm -hmm. At the time, they had like a homemade portal sort of site. I think it was called Wolfware or Wolf Locker or Wolf something. Mm -hmm. But it was basically just scrolling pages of text with an occasional image. It was really nothing like we have now. It was just, just scrolling web pages. 
But the possibilities for that, I thought, were just remarkable. I saw that it was going to get better, but I had, for instance, the, the state of North Carolina has employees in 100 counties, uh, especially with law enforcement and places like that. We had people literally driving from Asheville and sleeping in hotels so that they could take EEO, mm -hmm. like I said, harassment training yeah. or to sign some sort of benefit forms or to you know just sit through that it was just ridiculous the the amount of travel and inconvenience sometimes uh, that that we were encountering because of dragging people to training that really I don't even know if if it's appropriate to call it training or we had people on shifts mm -hmm. um, for for whatever reason I saw e learning as a as a real solution to a lot of a practical solution to a lot of our problems I don't know that I thought the training itself was going to get made better just because we put it online but I saw that we could deliver it right away people didn't have to wait a month mm -hmm. till the class was offered we didn't have to haul them you know to uh, to overnight which is inconvenient and expensive um, just just for them to sit through a presentation by the safety officer or what have you so that was also on my mind but we didn't really need um, a lot of it because of the scale situation with justice. We didn't have a thousand employees, right. and and um, you know you can't always justify the time and, and effort and money spent in creating online from scratch. But we did need that at the state level. So just about that time that all of these things were happening, the, the governor had changed over, and I was kind of outgrowing the job, and I'd gotten interested in e-learning. The state central training office is housed under the Office of State Personnel, which is now the State Human Resources. Um, they were getting interested in e-learning, and so there was a real opportunity, again, for me to go create a job. Yay! Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I was able to do that, and I went there in 2003. Okay. So, um, we had some off-the-shelf courses. We had done interaction management through Development Dimensions International for years. They had just started putting some courses online. So we bought, bought into the contract for that. Um, and we did very well initially offering uh, some blended, where they would do a good deal of the pre-work and watch the videos and stuff online. And then if we did have to bring people to Raleigh, it was just for a day instead of six trips, or it was just a couple mm -hmm. times instead of um, overnight three and four times. And that, that worked really well for us because they were getting, it was a good program. I thought I am was pretty good. They were getting good good quali high quality first experiences with e-learning and then they were getting real practice with real people and it, it worked very well and we were say I did the money cost on that back in the when I was working on the masters and I want to think it was a, a difference of maybe a thousand dollars a learner to mm -hmm. not to not make them come to Raleigh over and over I don't I have to go look it up now um, so about that time I was wrapping up the master's degree and and I had no budget, I had no money, <laughs> no money. I was learning Dreamweaver on my own. I was learning some graphics work on my own. Um, we didn't have products yet like Articulate or Captivate. I think I had a colleague who may have been using authorware back in the day, but mm -hmm. may have had access to that. Um, so I was, I was looking for inexpensive ways of getting information out to the masses, things that I could use uh, online survey materials, online game materials, online web creating tools. I think blogs had just been introduced, that kind of thing. And so I wrote my master's thesis on when you should use e-learning and how to do it with a minimum budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. I went to Training Magazine the year after I wrote the, the thesis and I did a presentation on cheap e-learning. This would have been 2003, maybe 2003 okay. or 2004. There was an editor from Pfeiffer in the audience who approached me afterward and said, we, we need this, we need a book. Mm -hmm. And so that is where the first book came from. And now Pfeiffer, the, they've lost that imprint, it's just Wiley now, and so all the books are there. So I wrote e-learning solutions on a shoestring based on what I had done with my master's work, and that got published, and that kind of changed my, my positioning in the world. Because back then, everybody wasn't online. Everybody didn't have a blog. Right. Everybody, we didn't have, we didn't have no Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't have all these social tools. So, you know, it was a, it was a smaller pond than it is now to have a, to have a book published and be a state employee was a, it was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and things really, as you know, accelerated after that. So you were the state e-learning coordinator mm -hmm. that, while you were doing this? This is the new job that you created? I was a state e-learning coordinator from 2003 until 2017. Okay. 
And when we created that job, we didn't even know what it meant. It was just Jane understands. <laughs> yeah. Jane, Jane understands some stuff on the web. We'll let her just. And you know, I kind of rode that my whole time there. That's just mm -hmm. they never knew what I was talking about. <laughs> they never. But understood. they empowered but you they and were let fine. you do They're your like, thing. Like what, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. It was easier just to say <laughs> yes to whatever I had going on. So. Um, you know, it's funny, people, there's there's this reputation that the state is so backward or that there's so much bureaucracy or so many rules. Mm -hmm. I could generally do pretty much whatever I wanted. The money was always the challenge. Right. You know, we just never had, you know, you hear about DOD being able to do all of these military simulations. And, you mm -hmm. know, we, could, we never, I never had that kind of money. Yeah. So, um, no, they were they were pretty much letting me do what I wanted. But now you have to understand the state is always going to be very interested in compliance training and mm -hmm. policy training and awareness training. I mean, that that is always just going to be a part of it. We're never going to do, you know, 3D knee surgery simulations right. at the state personnel office. But, but yeah, I, I, and when social media came along, um, People are always surprised when I say this. Beverly Purdue was governor then, mm -hmm. and Beverly Purdue uh, learned to leverage social media earlier than almost any politician I ever saw. Beverly Purdue figured out that it, that was, first of all, she said, "If you want to know something, you'll follow my Facebook page," mm -hmm. and she would release information there sometimes before she even told the press, which was brilliant yeah. because your message gets out without anybody massaging it or mm -hmm. hacking it or misleading. It anybody with it and she could respond to the public before the press could get you know she was always ahead of them they mm -hmm. didn't like that I don't think so um, so it was very savvy use but Beverly Purdue back to my point Beverly Purdue told us she said I expect employees to use social media this is how we can be more transparent to our tax paying public mm -hmm. And so we didn't have a lot of rules or blocks or, or being told, you know, we had basic communication policies anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but, but we had very much open reign to do what we wanted to do. So I never had handcuffs. And I think that people always think that government is so tough on that kind of thing, but she's right. You know, it did make us more, uh, more transparent. So it, it was fine. So... My interest went from classroom to e-learning to more facilitated e-learning. About 2000, early 2000-ish, I met Jennifer Hoffman, who at the time was inventing the idea of virtual classroom training. With Web, I think the product we were using then was Illuminate with an E. Mm -hmm. Illuminate. WebEx came along. Um, a number of other products came and went uh, along the way. So then I got interested in how we could do live online, how we could interact with people live, but but also not have them drive to Raleigh. Mm -hmm. And that, that became an interest. And then gradually it shifted to more interest in social, the broader idea of social learning. How can we collaborate with communities? How can we talk across geography? How can we, um, you know, what tools do we have that, that can enable more conversation on a broader scale? And how can we get it out of this training box? You know, everything so up to that point was a class of some kind. There was mm -hmm. a course, there was a class, there was a discussion board for the class. But social media really opened up a whole lot of new ways of connecting with your other users, with, with having conversations with users. The, um, the other problem I had that I haven't mentioned in that job is that the state designates training coordinators. Okay. And depending on the size of the agency, there may be just one person at like a little department of insurance or revenue. There may be 40 at somewhere like a department of corrections somebody huge like that, or transportation, and I found over the years a number of those, those people um, had become gatekeepers. And I would have the front line telling us that they needed training that we had offered last week and nobody had told them. Or they had been told, we're going to develop our own, and then it never came. So social tools were a way for me to hopscotch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> work directly, around them. directly to the front line. I mean, they could they could come straight to me or to us. Mm -hmm. um, there were some people that didn't like that, believe it or not. <laughs> but but it it was really really very effective. And my favorite story about this: there was a group of prison guards early in the days of Facebook. These prison guards, and this was in the days of Beverly Purdue, who said we could use social media any way we wanted. Mm -hmm. The prison guards had created their own private Facebook group because they said, we're all doing the same kind of work, and it's the same kind of stress, and it's the same kind of clientele, and we're trying to overcome the walls and the barriers that separate us. 
So this was for prison guards statewide, not just in Pasquotank, not just in mm -hmm. Selma or wherever they were. Um, and I happened to run across them one day and ask if I could join. I said, I'm researching this book. I'm real interested in you. I won't interfere. I won't rat on you. Or but management was aware of it. So they were above board and management knew. Management was not involved. But what I found interesting in that group is that there were a lot of conversations like, I want to advance and I don't know what I need to do. Uh, I want skills for this next level job and I don't understand what the qualifications are. Where can I get this training so that I can? Meantime, HR is over here with their website. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and state HR is over here posting job. Well, these people are all genuinely interested in advancing and doing better and learning more and nobody is there where they are. And that was a big lesson to me is well, you know, you can have your pretty website and you can update it every Tuesday, but these people never heard it was there or they're not checking it. And why isn't anybody from HR here? Why isn't anybody from recruiting mm -hmm. here? Why isn't anybody else from training here? And it wasn't that I was so great. I just happened to find them because I was researching a book. I mean, it's not like I was all that. But, um, but uh, what's funny is that group still exists, and I still don't see HR or recruiting or training there. They're still around 10 years on. Well, you With might have to listen to what they're asking for. You might have to respond. Um, uh, so not to get us way off topic, but I, I continue to see that as a problem. I see trainers or facilitators or people like that. They want to set up this site somewhere and have people come to that and participate. Mm -hmm. When they've already got their own stuff somewhere else and you need to go there. You need to go be where they are and not keep trying to drag them to the 17th community they've invited to. This mm -hmm. Right. So I had finished the master's, and at the time, that was at NC State, the master's was in technology and based training, and um, or adult education, technology and training, or something. And um, I had done the, the, the master's thesis was on the cheap e-learning, and that had turned into a book. At the time, and I don't know what they're doing now, at the time, North Carolina State's graduate program, and I think it's called HRD now, if you stayed continuously enrolled, if you went straight from the master's into the doctorate, you could carry all your credits. Mm -hmm. If you left even for a day, you lost 18 hours. And that's a lot when you're going part-time. So basically I ended up with the, with the doctorate because I didn't want to lose <laughs> 18 hours in case I wanted it later. But it, wor it worked out fine. Um, and at the time, I don't know again what they're doing now. I saw it changing a little as I was finishing up. But at the time there were a good many real practitioners involved as faculty with that program. There were people who had actually worked in the field, who had worked like as training directors in factories, who really got it. They weren't just academics, not mm -hmm. to put them down, but there is a disconnect sometimes. Yes. And so I found a lot of that work very practical. So I stayed on and, and did the doctorate. I was very interested in uh, learning about research methods. I found that kind of stuff fascinating, which is a good thing, because that's mostly you find out what the doctorate's going to involve is, is research methods. Um, and I, I had thought, you're like this, I had thought for years, my plan was I will do, a di my dissertation will be about why classroom instructors are so resistant to e-learning. Because I was working, again, I was the only one mm -hmm. back in this job as e-learning coordinator. I worked in a building full of trainers who were very resistant to the idea of putting their stuff online. My stuff, I need to be there. We need human, they need human, you know, just interaction, no matter what the content, no matter what the subject matter. Um, so I was very interested in pursuing that. And I had done a number of research courses where you have to write, you have to pretend to write your proposal and you have to pretend to write your lit review and you draft this kind of thing. I had done a lot of work on the topic of why, you know, why is there resistance from classroom trainers to e learning. And my dissertation chair uh, said, Jane, no one will be interested in that. <laughs> Well, guess what she was, right? Mm. Classroom trainer. Mm -hmm. Didn't want her stuff online. So, um, <laughs> you know, I had piles of information and piles of comments and piles of literature about tech, you know, class tra teacher resistance to technology. Jane, nobody would be interested in that. That's not an issue in our field. I'm like, well, okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, guy? You, you have a moment in graduate school where you can either write a dissertation or you can argue about it for another 15 years and all I wanted was to be done. Mm -hmm. So one day in conversation we were chatting about Winger's work on apprenticeship with Gene Lave. 
and just sort of gone on. And my, my chair said, well, you know, Winger has a framework for exploring communities of practice and nobody's ever tested it. And I went home and chewed on that for a couple days and I still have the email. I sent an email with the subject line, don't shoot me. <laughs> it said, how about we don't worry anymore about classroom trainer resistance e learning Let's write, what if I test Winger's framework against my own community of practice back to the people I had met back when I was at the hospital, right? So um, she really liked that idea and it worked out great. It worked out great. So the dissertation, Winger proposed that Communities of practice, it, 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 there, there are four ways in which members interact. There's meaning, community, practice, and learning. And across those dimensions, there are lots of, of elements you can pull out and study, like how familiar people are with each other, where, whether people stand on the periphery, and at what point they join up, at what point do they start moving back out. Um, he talks about um, the need for community to that, that over time it will continue to um, tune its enterprise. Mm -hmm. That, for instance, you may start out, and this is happening in a group, I mean, you may start out with a group of amateur musicians who just like to get together and sing, and suddenly somebody wants us to be performers. And that changes from we're just going to get together and sing to now we've got to choose 15 things and we have to argue about the keys and we have to practice these things and we can't just... So that is tuned. Are, are we going to do it or mm -hmm. are, we, are we not? So uh, there was a lot to explore. It ended up being 330 pages long. But I had, I had historical documents from this group that I had their meeting minutes. I had handouts. I had um, work from stuff they had done over the years. Uh, they had an annual conference I was able to go to. So I had piles of data for this group. And the, the basics of this group, it was very exciting. It's kind of fallen apart over the years. People retired and, and outgrew it or, or went, you know, I went into e-learning and other people were still classroom. But <clears throat> it was a group of classroom instructors who said they want to stamp out crappy training. They were tired of seeing so much bad training. And that was their, their enterprise, was they would get together, they had quarterly meetings and an annual conference, and they would get together and share ideas they had for delivering particular kinds of like that compliance and policy content that was so challenging. Uh, if they had had a new idea they wanted to try out, if they had invented a new game or a, or a group activity, or they wanted to produce a, introduce a new topic, they would come to the meeting and do that. So we would play the game with them and give feedback, or we would do the activity and give feedback, um, and they would give you the instructions for it so you could take it back to work. It was very much, very much um, collaborative, very, a lot of sharing. And one day someone said, you know, it's great, but if we're going to stamp out training statewide, it really should be more than the ten of us. So they opened the group up to a wider population and eventually they said, you know, this is great, but we probably need to help the new people. Mm -hmm. So this group on their own developed a six day train the trainer course on their own time at night and weekends. And it's still running now. I have it now. Mm -hmm. So it's 30, 30 years on. Wow. It's been revised a bunch of times. It's been updated a bunch of times. The faculty has changed many, many times, um, and we try to pull faculty from graduates. We try to sort of keep feeding. Mm -hmm. It's like a yeast starter. It's like yeah. sourdough starter. <laughs> we keep feeding. But, um, but this group, you know, they, they, we saw people, several of us ended up with doctorates, several of us ended up with books, several of us ended up not doing any of those things. Um, and we, we would sort of uh, mentor the newer folks if they had a lot of promise and they wanted to give, give something back. So it was a fascinating study and ended up being the dissertation and it's done very, very well. Um, I did not turn that into a book, but it has shown up in most of, most of my other stuff since. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was the day Barack Obama was elected. So it was 2008, I defended that dissertation. My last slide in my dissertation defense was me setting the APA manual on fire. <laughs> I didn't really mean it, but I don't have it anymore is all I'm saying. Uh, and so I was at the state a good while after that. That was even still, 2008 was still before really the big push for social media and stuff. That's all mm -hmm. been in the last decade or so. And one day I suddenly had enough time to retire with full benefits a little bit early, a year and a half early. Mm -hmm. I had not used most of my sick leave for across time, and you can sort of factor that into your... Um, departure date. So I was able to uh, retire with, with my pension and health insurance. I remember you announcing so that to I the world that. on social media. I and that. wasn't the actual date you were supposed to retire just recent? It was uh, it was the 1st of March. And mm -hmm. today's the 
six. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I've been retired forever. And yeah, it's it's you know, if you don't have surgery or something, you mm -hmm. can you can end up doing pretty stay pretty healthy. Um, I, I was lucky in that regard. But um, just about the time I was planning to, I knew that this was going to be happening. I had not announced it yet, but I, I let it be known around the community that I was probably going to be a free agent. And I wasn't necessarily looking for full time, but if anybody had anything to keep, to keep me in mind. And I, I mm -hmm. mentioned that to the big, the big media people. I presented a lot of events. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just so happened, it was about the time that... Uh, the job that Janet Clary and then Patty Shank and then um, 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 Sharon Vipon had been in at the eLearning Guild as the director of research, that job was opening up again and so I talked to the Guild and it, it's a wonderful fit. It's been the perfect job for me. Because mm -hmm. um, they're headquartered in California and I work for David Kelly who's in Long Island and I'm here and I can work from my house on my own schedule and my job is mostly to produce a research report a month and present things at their conferences that we've been working on with the research thing. So it's great. Sometimes we do a member survey, sometimes we do a lit review, sometimes this month I'm doing interviews with people who have some expertise uh, and it's very flexible scheduling. It's just been, it's been perfect for me and I learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's great. Excellent. Yes. That's a, so that's how you got to where you are today. <laughs> that seemed like a very long story. I guess, well, I, it took me 25 years. Well, I, <laughs> Yeah, no, I love it. This, this is exactly what I was looking for. And I'm only for. 32. I'm <laughs> okay. The dog is bored. <laughs> he's sleeping so I'm peacefully. I'm surprised he's not snoring. So um, let me segue here into the title of this video series is now HPT Videos, <laughs> Human Performance mm -hmm. Technology, the Application of Science, uh, Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to this concept of HBT or however you refer to it? You know, I think it goes back to those days at the hospital when I felt like so much of what we were doing had nothing to do with what people actually did at work. I, I mean, I just didn't see the idea of performance very often tying into what, particularly what I was doing with supervisory training, the people who were doing like nursing training and first aid, mm -hmm. where maybe you don't use first aid every day. It is a skill that you might need to enact on the job, physical skill you would have to do. But I just felt like everything I was working on was all of this theory and all of this high-minded examples and it didn't have much to do with real life. So I, I don't know that I ever called it anything in particular, but I, I did distinguish between knowledge delivery and skill development. I think. That's one of the reasons I like the DDI products so much mm -hmm. because everything about them was focused on and now we're going to practice mm -hmm. with these new skills. So. so that was early on in your career. Mm -hmm. So in that regard to evidence-based practice or, or again, whatever it might be called, who are some of your biggest influences in that? People or articles or books? Well, back, back early on, and then on into grad school, I would say it had more to do with, with it had less to do with people. Okay. <laughs> and it had much more to do with whatever I was reading at the time. Again, I discovered Maker and Pipe, and I discovered Zim King Kramlinger, and I discovered uh, Gloria Geary and Gary Rumler, um, Harold Stolovich, Piskarit, George Piskarich, um, who else? Let me think about who else was around then. Uh, the Games Trainers Playbooks. So Tiagi. And Tiagi. And um, uh, Ethan. Uh, you're, what's his last name? You know, it's going back so far. I don't. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. No, I, I for the purposes of helping people new to the yes. field coming in here, um, these are some of the uh, past hits of the. Uh, of the 60s and 70s and 80s, and mm -hmm. so who might they want to look up? Uh, Mager and Pipe, for example, and they're analyzing performance problems. There's some classics there that are kind of yeah. at the foundation of evidence-based practices for performance improvement and in the learning domain. Um, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, how would you do that? As an example for others uh, that they might uh, model it. Do you uh, mean about the research job or about my yeah. classroom job? I mean, no, the, the research job right now. Well, for the research job, we sit down and decide on topics a, f a few months out. We, try, we, don't, we don't tend to go a whole year out because things change, especially with technology. Often we look to connect something to... Um, 
a guild event, for instance, we've got the learning I and mean, the realities 360 conference happens in June, and so our April report is going to be from Julie Dirksen, and it's about uh, uh, user focus and usability in AR VR, designing instruction for AR VR. So mm -hmm. in that case, it ties directly to an event. Sometimes it's general interest. Uh, last year, one of our, our hot topics was a thorough lit review on learning styles, mm -hmm. which was a huge undertaking. There's so much out on that. Um, so it, 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 either tie, it may tie to an event or it may not, but generally we pick out a few topics and I work on those uh, going out ahead of time. I'm way over your 30 seconds on that. So let me, let me come at this again. So a new neighbor uh, comes, moves into your neighborhood here and you're at a party because I know that okay. you have a lot of neighborhood parties. Right. What do you tell, they say, do what, what do you time. do? So I work for the eLearning Guild. I'm their director of research, and once a month I produce a research report, produce a research report on something that is particularly of interest to our membership or ties to one of our events. That does it. There you go. Um, I want to talk about uh, you as a lifelong learner, yep. and what's your current because of your job. Your that directs a lot of uh, what you're looking at and learning from but uh, is there a current or next focus for your learning are you working on learning uh, or writing anything now that you can share with us and I, I guess it goes back to the current job but is there something outside of that or I guess what you're doing in the current job here the research that you're exploring well you know sometimes with the current job it's something I know something about or that I'm interested in like right now the the new report next month will be on accessibility and e-learning and that's all that's been a concern of mine for 20 years um, last year a concern of mine has been this weird love of learning styles that you and I could talk about <laughs> all day so sometimes it's something that's kind of my fire is lit but sometimes it's something that the guild needs mm -hmm. I didn't know much of anything about AR VR and now I am just I am in love with AR mm -hmm. I think that the VR is sexy and people are all in love with that but I think there's huge potential for augmented reality in our line yeah. where I think there's huge potential and I'm afraid that people are looking past it because they're too interested in in VR. the VR stuff. I think mm -hmm. AR's got an enormous, but I didn't know much at all about that until I worked on the report. And similar with AI, I know some about artificial intelligence, but but be, being asked to do an in-depth research report to produce 30 pages on it, to mm -hmm. encapsulate it, to find out what the industry is doing or find out where the research is going, it really does force your focus. And now they've opened up really new lines of interest for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the AI and big data stuff can be daunting. Mm -hmm if you're new to it and I find that being able to help interpret a little for people that being on the more practical work application side of yeah. it is very useful and I find I'm able to keep up better with people in the field there's a lot of talk lately about analytics and data and to be honest with you I kind of ran from that mm -hmm. for a long time it, it was a little intimidating because I was afraid they were gonna make me do square roots or something <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but now I, I you know I feel like I, I have a a, a decent understanding of it. I can hold my own in most conversations, mm -hmm. and so that's that's helped a lot. As far as lifelong learning, this I let this slip on Twitter the other day. I'm not opposed to doing another master's degree okay. someday. I'd, I'd kind of like to maybe pursue cognitive psychology, maybe mm -hmm. not neuroscience, but but more of the the science of learning than I've had. And you know, I had a lot of instructional design mm -hmm. in the past, less on the cognitive the psychology side of it. I, I, I could see doing a master's sometime maybe. We'll see. What I love about a lot of your writing, <laughs> your nuts and bolts approach to things or are making things practical mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the practitioners out in the field and you're not writing for theorists and academics. Um, so that'll be interesting to see where yeah. you where you take all of that. Um, you know, I, I worry that our field's got an awful lot of theorists and academics in mm -hmm. it and not people who've had actual jobs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes someone will let something slip on like Twitter and it exposes them completely. I'm like, you never did, you never <laughs> actually worked anywhere with other people, did you? Mm -hmm. um, um, you yeah, know. you've never been asked by your father to hold a flashlight right. and get yelled at get for yelled pointing at, for at the right the, thing. Like, yeah, you, you never, you never really did this, yeah. and, and it's funny that they'll tip their hand every now and again. But we got a, a lot of people who I think probably need to go have a job for a couple of years before they write anything. Else. Well, we do, we do need our theorists and the mm -hmm. people who are thinking beyond you know the limits of today. And but then at some point they've got to get real. Um, 
I don't, know that I, call people... them, I don't know that I call them theorists either, guy. They just yeah. seem to be bloviating about stuff, well, and yeah. they, they just seem to not have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just don't have jobs. I don't have a job. I'll be a consultant now. Maybe consultant's the word I'm looking for. Hey, guy, you're yeah. a consultant, aren't you? I'm yes. Sorry. Well, yes. sorry. I've been yeah. known to do but that. But you have had jobs. I've, 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 yeah, known, so I've, I've known you when you worked at a job. Yeah, and... Uh, you know, that, I think that making things real, whether and consultants have to, you know, it depends on what kind of consulting you're doing. If you're there to advise somebody, it's one thing, but if you're there to get a job done for them, if you're their hired pair of hands and that, then you, you have to make it real. Yeah. So um, It's funny. I remember in grad school, and we've had this conversation on Twitter this week. I, I don't remember what prompted me, but I asked people if they felt that their graduate work had been worthwhile. And almost, literally, all but one person said yes. Mm -hmm. Every single one said something about, yes, it was worth my time. Yes, I got a lot out of it. Um, I, re I remember it, several of them also said it was better that I had worked a while and then went back. I had done this yeah. for 10 years. I remember in grad school, my master's program in particular, I had been in the business, you know, almost a decade, I guess, by then, close to it. And, you know, I knew kind of how the real world worked when you mm -hmm. talked about organizational training and development. And there were these kids who had come straight out of undergrad school into this master's program who'd never been to a class. They'd mm -hmm. never been to training. Yep. They had been to lots right. of classes, but never to training. And they would, <laughs> and they've got these academics teaching them. And they would say things like, "Well, we'll get, but we'll just have management come to every orientation. We will just have the CEO right. come to orientation every month and welcome everybody." And they would all look. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Mm -hmm. good luck. The, and the CEO is going to love that idea one time. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to your early days in this world of evidence-based practices okay. for performance improvement in the learning and development world. Um, what I'm looking for here is some stories of, of people from your past. Now, you do a lot of presentations, so a lot of this would be uh, stories that would make humanize some of the people in the field, uh, the peop names that are perhaps known to others in our audience here or perhaps unknown people that you would like to acknowledge for, you know, what they've done for you in your career. Well, you know, in thinking about evidence-based practice, I would say I think the biggest light bulb ever that I ever had was in my master's work when I ran across the work of Richard Mayer. Okay. Uh, Mayer had his, his designs, of multi, his principles of multimedia learning, and I ran into that at a time when I was trying to explain why it was a bad idea, but I wasn't really sure why, except that's what I thought, why we didn't want to narrate every word of every e-learning program we did, why we didn't want dancing cats mm -hmm. for interest on every... So he, that was a real, not just an eye-opener, but it was finally the validation that I was looking for, but also the, the language I needed to explain, no, the, no, we don't want to narrate every word. Let's talk about this. People hear and read at different speeds. Mm -hmm. And when you're narrating every word, they're not really getting either. And then everybody would go, oh, she's right. Oh, we get that. And, you know, the answer, the obvious answer, the simple answer was just let's just have audio they could turn on or off. And that way it's there or not. Um, but that was a real eye opener to me and gave me the words I needed and gave me credibility. I mean, the guy was for real and here's his article and here's 25 pages on this and mm -hmm. here's 17 articles on that. And here's a book. And, and then also Sweller and... Nguyen and uh, Ruth Clark were doing work along the same lines, and, and Mayer led me to that. He was working with, I believe, a woman named Moreno, and they, bless their hearts, were putting a lot of their stuff online. It wasn't all locked up in a, in a, you know, in a journal, which mm. because I was in grad school, I could get to. Right. But even back then, not everything was electronic yet. So mm -hmm. you know, because we barely had electricity, <laughs> um, and so I was able to actually, you know, throw out here. Here's real evidence and here's real, real practice. Um, again, it was kind of before the age of social media when, when I was getting to be really aware of evidence-based practice. I was doing some consulting work with uh, the national, gosh, what were they called? It was a national board of corrections, but it was primarily associated with prisons and parole. And uh, a woman I worked with there is a woman named Sue Yeras, and she had a doctorate. And she introduced me to the evidence-based practice in the corrections field. And I saw that she was able to convince them that we didn't just need a bunch of talking heads reading presentations to people all day, that we needed actual hands-on work, that people mm -hmm. needed real practice. She was able to sway the oldest of old-school 
HR administrator types who really just wanted somebody to read slides. She was, I watched her able to move the needle on that and I thought that was pretty impressive given, given her stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So I paid attention when she would talk about evidence and I would pay attention to the, now that was evidence mostly out of the corrections community mm -hmm. and I don't, I'm not very fluent in it anymore but it was very useful at the time and it helped me understand that you could do that. That you needed to develop how to how to develop credibility, how to develop the language you needed, um, and that helped a whole lot. So, who else uh, would you like to recognize her? I know you deal with <laughs> lots and lots of people, so it's almost unfair to ask you. To it is unfair a, to ask if you to tell some stories on a few people. But uh, in your trips to Europe, and I uh, I think I saw you you know you go out to dinner with a lot of these folks and. Uh, what are some of the more interesting tidbits that you can tell about them that won't uh, offend them? I find, I don't know, I was a little surprised by this. I find Jane Hart to be remarkably stable and consistent and persistent. And she has been around a good long while with your friend Clark and all mm -hmm. of them, the Internet Timelines people. But I, I have always looked up to Jane quite a lot. Um, because she has so, so consistently for so many years stuck to her guns. Uh, we need for learners to take charge of their learning. We need to quit just, you know, dunking them into what we call training and expecting it's going to matter. We need to look more at performance. But she has, she has, uh, you know, swung fists at that for as long as I can remember. I mean, I, I think she's mentioned in my first book, and that was 2004 probably. Mm -hmm. So I, I get a lot of enjoyment from Jane Hart and from her work and that she is just she is just relentless. She doesn't stop and she'll dig in and she'll hold her own in these fights about it. Um, I'm trying to think of tidbits. I'm not doing you a very good job. After we're done today, I'm going to think of all kinds of, of cute little stories. Um, I will say one of my favorite anecdotes is from Mark Rosenberg, mm -hmm. who's mostly retired himself these days. Mark did the really the first book on e-learning. Mm -hmm. And one of the critical things that Mark says in that is he reminds, and I think this is brilliant, he reminds us that we are, are not in the delivery business, that we are in the performance business. And one of the things he, he the, the analogy he makes, he says the railroad industry failed because it defined itself as being in the train business and not mm -hmm. in the transportation business. Right. And Rosenberg said, we are in the learning business, not in the classroom business. We need to get straight on what it is we're here to do. Mm -hmm. Which, at the time, of course, really spoke to my interest in why there was resistance to classroom training. So Rosenberg was, uh, I think, was really important, especially in the early days. Thinking back about my graduate work around that time, when I was doing all that research that ended up not getting used, um, there were several names, including Elizabeth Bird, who at the time was at a school, I want to say she was in Nova Scotia or somewhere in Canada, and I tried to hunt her down a couple of months ago. I wanted to quote her on something in a research article I was writing, and I wasn't quite sure where I'd heard her or seen her say it, and she's quite literally taken off for the outback. She's retired, mm. and she is unreachable in Australia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Australia, so I did my best to quote her. I may have gotten it a little bit wrong, but Liz Burge talked about... Um, the false distinction we make when we set up comparing online to e-learning. Okay. I mean, online to live training. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, it really depends on what experience you're giving the learner. It doesn't matter how they access it. Mm -hmm. You can have a bad PowerPoint show online and a bad PowerPoint show in the classroom, and they're both still bad. You can have a great e-learning experience and a bad PowerPoint in the classroom. And right. it's... You know, it's not that we, we make the wrong distinction there. We need to evaluate. And I see that going on all the time now. I see people comparing VR to classroom mm -hmm. or, or um, micro to not. My, it's like, you're, that's, that's not, we're not making the right comparisons. False distinction is an important phrase. So there was Liz Birch, there was Mayer, there was Mark Rosenberg. Um, I'm trying to think, I know that I'm going to get in trouble. I'm forgetting really obvious, obvious things. Maybe they'll come back around before we're done today. All right. Thank you, though, for that. And it, and it is hard to pick out the, uh, you know, 
people that you would like to acknowledge because especially when there's so many and you get around so yep. you've been exposed to lots of different people and have learned from lots of, I of certainly, folks. I, I really have and I've been very lucky you know and I have to give it to the state credit for a lot of that the mm -hmm. state as long as I was doing their job they didn't really mind all these other little things yeah. I had yeah. cooked and I did I did what they paid me for. But I, I was amazed at times I thought well how is she here there and everywhere well, and uh, as well, a state know, employee here, that's the good news is when you're deal. designing e-learning, you don't have to be in Raleigh necessarily. Do <laughs> exactly. it when you're a classroom trainer. Yeah. you know it's different. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about that a little bit more? Sure. It's on my mind. Let's talk about that a little bit more because it's it's kind of coming back all that research I did on um, the classroom trainer resistance. Peg Ertmer from I think she was at Purdue. She may still be there. Uh, did a did a good deal of work that made a, a big impression on me. But one of when I was researching what the resistance was because I didn't understand it. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought it solved our problems and it could be cheaper and the, the workers liked it better. And I had these classroom trainers who were just determined they would rather stand there for eight hours a day with markers. I didn't, under, I didn't understand it. Um, and so I was looking at what, what it was that made them resistant. There were several interested, there's a lot of reasons, but the, the research I was especially interested in are that the, the people who view their job as being experts, mm -hmm put a lot of value in that. If their identity is tied up yeah. in, I'm the expert on EEO, I'm the expert on employment law, I'm the expert on first aid, whatever, do they have a very hard time letting that go, which I didn't realize until I started doing the research that this is who they are. It's the, this is what yeah. I am. It's the person who knows about this. And it's funny when you talk about how people design their jobs, there's an old joke an old little ditty in the trainer world that's, that's, if you ask a librarian what her job is, you can tell what she thinks of it by whether, you, you know, does she think her job is to help people find books or to protect the books from the people? <laughs> yes. Right. And we've all known librarians like that. And it's kind of those trainers. My job is not to help you learn. It's for you to hear me talk, right? Mm -hmm. Or for you to hear me present. So there was that aspect of it. There was also, and, and a bunch of the literature is out of K-12 more than his workplace. We can talk mm -hmm. about that later if you want. But there was um, there was also this this fear that the students would know something I don't. They know how to work this equipment and I don't. They know how to use this Google and I don't. They know how to make the projector work. And so we just won't do that because I don't want to look stupid in front of these kids. You know. Mm -hmm. So so there was an, an element of that too, which I thought was a little bit surprising. It was just kind of, you know, I, I just saw so much potential that it, it was very frustrating to watch the resistance. To you, it. Wouldn't, and in fact, you wouldn't quite be the expert if you didn't right. know everything but that I, touches But I will that. say this, um, the program that was the, prime, the, the, the primary project I was supposed to do for state government in 2003 is still not done. Hmm because of resistance from the classroom instructors associated with it. It mm -hmm. is still, it is 2019 and they just have never, they just quit pursuit, they just quit asking, they just quit mm -hmm. trying. Management just let it go. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> it's amazing, but yeah, but I never did the one thing that they brought me to do, but I did a lot of other stuff, so well. It should work, work out. out. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mentioned this uh, before we started because I wanted to make sure you're okay with this. I've got a couple of questions on uh, topics of perhaps controversy. Okay, okay. So, uh, talk to us a little bit about your stance on best practices. Why you seem to be opposed um, to best practices, or perhaps you're not. I don't know that I'm opposed. I just think that that it's fine to be aware of what other people are doing. It's fine to be aware of the way you might go about something, I think it is probably a mistake to assume that because something works well here, that it's going to work equally well for you. For one thing, and I had a friend who said, we were at a meeting one day talking about this, and a friend of mine said, that is like saying the things that work in my marriage will work in your marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's very individualized, it's according to the context and the people involved. Um, Dil Dilbert had a great cartoon once where Dilbert is saying, well, you know, if everybody's doing it, then best practices is just mediocre. Right. And the pointy-haired boss says, stop giving, stop making mediocrity sound like a bad thing, <laughs> mediocrity sound like a bad thing. Um, but, but the other problem you have when you start talking about best practices, and you see this across many, many elements, it's not just with best practices, is, is the problem with um, fidelity. 
-hmm. is that, okay, there's a best practice here. And so we're going to take it, but we don't have this guy and we don't have that scooter and we don't have that projector. So we're going to, so by the time it's, they try to adapt it, it's not that practice anymore. It's right. something else. And I don't need to tell you that in any undertaking, there is always somebody who can make it not work. Mm -hmm. That's what they got up this morning was not to make it work. Atul Gawande, I'm pretty sure it's in Outliers. Uh, Atul Gawande writes about the Cleveland Clinic. There is someone at the Cleveland Clinic who has a phenomenal success rate with keeping adult cystic fibrosis patients alive. He has they, must, they often make it to their 20s. He's got people in their 40s. And they have sent many different teams to go in and study this, this guy. And basically it comes down to his commitment and time spent with the patients. That it is him. He is sort of the linchpin. And he will challenge them and he'll argue with them and he won't let them get away with not taking meds and not doing their treatments and not doing... Um, but they go and write down everything this guy does and they make all these notes and they go back to their clinic. Well, they're not going to do that thing. Mm -hmm. They do all these other things and then they say, well, it doesn't work. So the problem with fidelity and replication yeah. is also an issue. So I don't think it's the best practice itself. It's that it's very hard to copy it and make it work. True. Um, you can't retrofit something. I think that was one of the things that the Japanese would joke about when Americans came over to, in, to look at Japanese quality and quality improvement approaches and they would laugh because America Americans came over and thought, oh, they just take some notes, see that, and they go back and replicate it. And they couldn't because the context was different, different enough. Right. So it's really the, the this concept of the wholesale adoption of a best practice, yes. which is ridiculous. The other thing I see, it, it's an it, and I don't remember where I first heard this phrase, but I, somebody one day described, you remember when I talked about the gatekeepers in state mm -hmm. government, the people that kind of kept stuff from happening? Somebody said that what she was a specialist in was resistance by delay. <laughs> she will always say, oh, well, we're going to work on that, but first we need to do, oh, well, we want to make that perfect, so we'll just, and nothing ever got done yeah. in the name of we're going to do something better just any day now, and nothing ever happened. And I see that sometimes with, we, we say we want to study best practices when it's often really we don't know what to do, so we're just going to spend time pretending that we're doing, mm -hmm. pretending that we're doing this thing, and we're never actually going to do. It. We're just going to spend, spend time. So sometimes I feel like it's a delay tactic. You and Simple, uh, who wrote organizations don't tweet, people do. He's mm -hmm. a really fun guy. He's on Twitter. He's he's fun to engage. With. He's a really smart guy. Worked for BBC for years, and now he does consulting with the UN and stuff. He's really he's really quite, he's entertaining and he's very smart. But he said people need to quit wanting more case study porn and just get on with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I see that. People who, who just won't do anything. Do you have a case study? Do you have a case study? Do you have a case study? Is there a best practice? Can we, it's like, dude, you go be the case study. Quit yeah. waiting for, study for every, you go, you go be a case. Well, you know, just do something. So mm -hmm. yeah. Experiment and yeah. Uh, and I, so I see that's a long answer, but I, I don't know that it's the concept of best practice I object to. It's just, I see people not not getting very far with them. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for that. Yeah. The next area of uh, <laughs> perhaps controversy is your take on ROI, return on investment. Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you there's no such thing as ROI of training, but the training people will beat me about the head and neck about that. I think that people who talk about ROI very often misunderstand or they grossly underestimate their ability to isolate the effects of training from everything else. Mm -hmm. If you've got too many forklift, you got 50 forklift accidents and it's costing a million dollars and somebody decides that's too much, you can implement forklift safety training. Too many people are running into things. People don't look when they back up. People are ignoring that. You can, you can fix that. And at the end of a year, you can say, okay, this year we only had 22 forklift accidents and it only cost half a million dollars and we have our, here is our RI. Mm -hmm. um, again, to quote Delbert, one time the pointy-haired boss said they had set their safety goals for the, for the year and they had to hurt six people to meet it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I do think if it's something as clear-cut and straightforward as that, you probably can sit down with a pencil and say, this is, this is exactly that. I think it is different, as in the case of a class I took years and years ago, um, you assert that you're going to measure the ROI of ethics training for law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. 
I think if you had 10 years to devote to assessing that, you probably could track back number of lawsuits, cost of lawsuits, cost of the media by... I think maybe eventually you could. I think it would be very hard to say that you're going to get X dollar ROI from a topic like that. So I, it, it's just very, very hard to isolate. The same thing happens, Gawande, who I guess I need to give more credit to because I keep mentioning his name, Gawande talks about that in reference to hand washing training. A hospital has um, a problem with staph infections, they implement hand washing training, but they also put in hand wash stations, they also put in sanitizer, um, bottles all over mm -hmm. the place. They put stickers on doors of especially infectious, infectious patients. It's very hard to say the training solved right. $25 of that. Yeah. Right? And I think that's where people make their mistakes. I think that they tout ROI as the perfect end-all, easy-to-calculate solution, when very often it's not. I do think that we need to do a better job of stepping up when training has made at least some of the difference or, or claiming what training owns of this solution. But the other part of the story with Gawande, as I recall, is it turned out the real big factor in reduction of the staph infections, um, what was happening was that they, they implemented the same solution across the hospital and one particular unit saw a sudden decrease in staph infections but nobody else. Hmm. Or they, they didn't see the dramatic change. And it turned out there was one nurse who was willing to block a doctor and say, you go wash your hands. You know, or the janitor who knew that something was being disposed of in the wrong way. It often wasn't any of the things, any of the things mm -hmm. that were really part of this intended solution. So, <clears throat> so anyway, I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I just think it's not as clear cut to, to just walk around saying ROI, ROI, calculate it, calculate it. And I will say that some of the people I know who tell ROI the hardest and the loudest do not work in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they don't have jobs. They aren't in the situations where there are other humans. This does look very clinical and easy on paper. Right. But you go work in the hospital <laughs> where you're not on the shift where that nurse is blocking the doctor. You know, it's... It, it's too many variables. Again, back to, back to context, back to too many variables, and back to it's hard to isolate the effects of training in many, not all, but in mm -hmm. many situations. I would say all the talk about leadership and supervisory training would also mm -hmm. fall yeah. under a lot of that. <laughs> Thank you. I, so where I see most people focusing on ROI is kind of after the fact, proving it in after the fact versus saying, well, we've got a budget of X, we can only afford half of the mm -hmm. things that we should work on, which are the things that are going to leverage most. So as a forecasting model, Again, it's problematic because there's more variables than just people's knowledge and skills. Uh, even if they have the knowledge and skills, they may be resisted or directed mm -hmm. to do otherwise by their peers That's or their boss. Point. Or, yeah. But, but uh, that way of doing it. But anyway, so I, again, I just wanted to capture your views <laughs> on return on investment because it, there's times when I thought, well, I, was, I would push back on that. But, uh, but, but I wanted to know where you were coming from, and I fully agree with what you've said here. Um, I was going to say, but you, you, again, I have lost the thought. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Something you were saying. I do. I do think you make a very good point about the fact that, that again, there's a fidelity problem. You may have set up a solution, and the employees may be told not to do it that way, or they've mm -hmm. been told to cut a corner, or they've been told well, we don't have time yeah. for it. You know, I think again, there's lots of things that can interfere. I think there are a thousand things that can get between a learner or a worker and that performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, As Rumler would have said, it's the consequence system. And yeah. uh, you really have to look at that to see why is why are there certain behaviors here <sighs> when people may even know better. And so you've got to be wary of that when you're doing an instructional solution is that, you know, how receptive is that going to be back at the ranch? Um, you know, or will it be uh, shot on site? Well, um, you know, while you're talking about things being done after the fact and names in the business, I knew Don Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. I didn't know him well, um, but he was around earlier in my career, and I met him several times. Mm -hmm. I was in presentations he did several times, and even he said that they had flipped his model. They were implementing it backward, that you yeah. should start with what change do you want to see in your organization yeah. and work back to did they like the donuts? Yeah, exactly. And not start with did were they, they happy that the room was warm? You mm -hmm. know, um, he he said that people had gone, and he right. also said there was no there was no RO, thing as ROI. But I y'all can take that up with Dunker Patrick. Yeah. But um, but but this evaluation by autopsy mm -hmm. 
is is a real problem in our business. I think waiting until it's over, or or waiting to see how it ends up to decide how you're going to evaluate it. I think that that is a, a challenge we've got, and I think that there are concerns about his taxonomy and it was never a theory it was never really even a model mm. it was don just one day wrote an article yeah. with, and it was not meant with to be someone levels. else cats yeah. cats and cat there was a there was a co-author right. that will, will talk about. about but um but but at the time it's it's what we had you mm -hmm. know and he was an, he's an important name. He got the idea of evaluation on people's radar. Mm -hmm. And maybe we've clung to that exactly as written a little too long. But, but he had concerns about the very thing that we are talking about, having concerns mm -hmm. about. Yeah. So. Let's shift now to uh, just in general. Um, you spend a lot of time on social media, Twitter and Facebook. I do. Um, and <laughs> there are things that people are touting on social media. Uh, do you have any pet peeves in particular that you would like to address here and help guide the I rest do. of us uh, away from or towards something? I do, but I want to tell you something first. I have a story for you first. That okay. One day, um, now my boss at the time, toward the end of my career with state government was was much younger than I am um, and she had a life she had little kids and she had a life and she's done at three she's done she didn't obsess about very many things mm -hmm. but she and she had come from a situation where all of her staff were remote so she was very used to dealing with workers she couldn't see all the time she was used to working online um, <laughs> and she would ask me to go ask my Twitter people things she said I need to know something could you ask your uh -huh. Twitter ask your Twitter friends but one day she came down the hallway and she said, IT is fussing. They say we're eating up too much bandwidth and they're done. And, 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 and. I said, well, it's probably because I'm on Facebook all day. She said, it probably is. And she just, <laughs> you know, it's a very different mm -hmm. world. Um, and it was not even true. I'm like, we are not using too much. There's some, something yeah, wrong with the store. But I'm like, yeah, you know, own it. <laughs> own it. But I had all that stuff open all the time. I... I was talking with, um, I actually hesitate to say a name because I might get her in trouble. I'll be in trouble on my own. I was talking with someone else who's been in the business a long time about this just a few weeks ago. When we started, and I mentioned this earlier, when we started, there, there were not blogs. Everybody didn't have a website. Everybody didn't have a blog. To have a book was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, to be one of the speakers associated with a, with a book or an invited speaker was a big deal. And now everybody's got a blog everybody's got a website and we have 700 people all trying to talk about the same 10 things mm -hmm. and everybody's trying to say something new and none of it really is and everybody's trying to create new content and everybody's in a scramble and I I understand it um, we seem to have a lot of people just trying to get a foothold to get themselves known or get their names out there who haven't done much else. I don't know what else to say about it, but they don't they haven't written very much in detail or they haven't introduced anything much new or that they just seem to be repeating what we've already heard. It's just very hard and I, I think it is hard to get new ideas. Um, and I think we have also already said a lot of stuff. But but some of my pet peeves are people who um, who who just seem to be trying to stick their foot in the door. It's kind of like the Bible salesman yeah. that you've heard about, but they aren't adding much. Um, I have people who use the term PLN, PLN, PLN. I'm like, but you don't bring anything. I don't learn anything from you. You haven't said anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. And, you know, you're copying 25 people into this conversation to make it look as if they're all engaging with you when you're just kind of spamming everybody. So I, I see a good deal of that. I see... Um, I see people who need to do a little research before they start advertising that they've got some hot new idea. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to say it was David Sedaris, but I think I'm wrong, who says every generation thinks they invented sex, yes. discovered sex. It's like, you didn't invent collaborative learning. Mm -hmm. You didn't invent... <laughs> You did not invent workflow learning. You did yeah. invent performance support. This is not new. And, and they, they don't understand. Then they complain that they're not getting more uptake or they don't get invited to speak or, or something. And they're complaining out loud about this stuff. I'm like, well, you need to find a new twist or a new take or a new mm -hmm. um, format or a new process or you know something. But, but 
you sound a little silly when you're acting like you just thought this up this morning. It's like, really? Yeah. What's old is uh, <coughs> new again. And uh, it, that seems to be a big issue where we're changing the language. We're yes. diffusing meaning yeah. because now we have 14 labels for one thing. Yeah. And the only reason is that somebody felt a need to market an idea or a, a product or service and so they're going to call it something uh, right. hip, we'll hipper just, and sexier. And, we'll just have a new name for this thing we've always had. It's funny, yeah. one time I got a call years and years ago, my, I was at my office, um, this would have been, I don't know, 2010, probably 10, 10 or 12, I had a co-worker from another building, a colleague call up and say that he had just discovered this online product, you had to pay for it, that would let you narrate your PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm like, please tell me you didn't buy this. <laughs> please tell me, yeah. you know. But he was just on fire. I'm like, you just, you just sound ridiculous. Why are you calling me to talk to me? It's like, <laughs> were you? Did you try to sell them the Google then? You were going to come over and sell the Google. I didn't try to sell them the Google because I knew they already had it. But, um, <laughs> but I, I see a lot of that. I see, you know, the foot in the door kind of stuff. And I, and I do think some people just are not badly intended. They just don't know, or they're new to the field, and they really do think. They've got some hot new mm -hmm. idea. And I try real hard not to be the old cranky uh, worker who's been somewhere for 55 years and doesn't want to hear anything the new kids have to say. I think there are some new voices in our world that are really valuable and they've got a lot to say. And I look forward to seeing what, what they end up doing. Um, but I do feel like a lot of it is just people needing to try to generate content. Yeah. And they just don't know. We've, they've got the platform, they need start. something to say. Um, so. and, and some of them, to back to my point, they probably need to get jobs for a while. They need to go work in, the, mm -hmm. in a workplace with other people and do training. I think classroom training can be invaluable mm -hmm. um, for a person who's never done any of that. I think you learn a whole lot about your audience, you yeah. learn a whole lot about how to engage adults, you learn a lot about how to... Um, talk in, at different levels in different formats or say the same thing in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot to be said for being in a training, in, a, in an organization that does that, even just for a little while. Um, Let me uh, shift to one last uh, social media <laughs> tool out there. Uh, LinkedIn. Yes. I've heard you say before that you I don't, don't you don't LinkedIn. get it. I don't get LinkedIn, but okay. other people don't get Twitter and I've had to accept that. Um, I think partly with LinkedIn is that for all of my years of everything, I have never needed to look for a job online, um, including my current one. I, and I am not in a position where I am trying to, uh, to generate, to, to do business development. I'm not in mm -hmm. marketing. I'm not trying, I don't need a million contacts from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a really certain kind of niche group that's going to buy my books, that's going to invite me to speak at their things. Um, and so I, it just isn't terribly personally relevant to me but I would go on there and I'm like well it's like Facebook without any fun and it's just a bunch of people it reminds me of going to there are certain training organizations that have chapter meetings I won't mention them but there are some mm -hmm. more than one there's one not just one and sometimes I go to these meetings and all I see are people handing each other's business cards around yeah and they don't Again, it's like Twitter Live with these people not offering anything new and they don't have anything new to say. And they, and what was always interesting for me was they hate state government and the taxpayers don't want anybody to have a job except if I had one for them. They were yeah. very interested if I had any work for them. And then they will complain about how hard it is to work for government. Um, so I think partly, and it's a good example of something when it's just not very relevant to you mm -hmm. or not of use to you, that... It, you don't really get why other people like it so much and people there are a lot of people i finally had to understand are never going to like twitter ever right um but you know about the social media in in general i was in a situation virtually my whole life where i was the only one interested in whatever it was i was doing yeah. at the time particularly when e-learning and social learning uh, social media based kind of stuff came along. Nobody in my work world was interested in that. Nobody in my immediate office environment, nobody in state government that I ever knew about. So social media was a way for me to finally have people I could interact with who really wanted to talk about what I wanted to talk about, who were trying to do the things I was trying to do, who had some experience I could learn from. Um, when I wasn't getting that at all from my mm -hmm. peers, I was working with classroom trainers and they were fine, but they wanted to talk about which markers smelled better. Yeah. 
and how to do two truths and a lie icebreakers and mm -hmm. all that's great and they were good at that but it was no longer of any interest at all to me no. so if it hadn't been for social media particularly twitter back then I, you know i i don't know how i would have managed it, it really was where my community was and mm -hmm. the thing i especially liked about twitter was that i could go online anytime day or night and somebody was talking about something that i didn't even know i wanted to talk about mm -hmm. somebody was talking about something interesting or they had, had written something interesting where i wasn't finding that from linkedin mm -hmm. and i wouldn't say i was getting that from facebook facebook something different for me but twitter i have always found um very energizing and very interesting and very exciting and I just wasn't finding that other places and I'll be honest with you when snapchat showed up I'm like oh another yeah. one. here's another one and I've tried really hard but I I like snapchat and I use snapchat I don't see for all of the, the stuff you hear of the the naysaying and the sky is falling stuff you heard from about other tools I really do not see snapchat getting much uptake in the workplace anytime soon mm -hmm. So it hasn't been the first thing I've spent my time learning about, but I do like it. So, you know, I, I, it's more I don't, I don't get it when I look at LinkedIn. And then I have all these people tell me they don't get it either, but yet they feel like they have to post stuff there mm -hmm. so it'll get seen. Right. So um, now I will say LinkedIn is doing really interesting stuff with learning. You know, mm -hmm. since they took lynda.com, they've got SlideShare. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Mm -hmm. What do you think about LinkedIn? Well, I, I think it is a place for more marketing your idea, products and services. Um, and um, it, it's a different tool. The, the conversations there are a little bit different there, but uh, uh, I'm both equally on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, but I'm, and my network on LinkedIn is a little bit different than the people on Twitter. Um, and because you're not capped by the amount, you know, so people can go on longer and, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you, you can link to th other things elsewhere. The people are writing articles and posting them via LinkedIn. And so it, it's just a little bit different. I, there's a lot of redundancy and overlap uh, between them, yes. but um, I, well, I don't know. Well, one thing that I see, speaking of redundancy and overlap, um, and it concerns me a little bit. And I think I see this more on LinkedIn than other places. And it may just be because I'm not looking on Facebook for this kind of thing. I am I'm concerned about the number of, of, link, of LinkedIn groups that people seem to have started intentionally to talk about the same thing that 7,000 other LinkedIn groups are talking yes. about because I want to be in charge of one. I want to mm -hmm. be the one. In, and that's back to what we were saying earlier about these people who are trying to get a foothold. It, it There's something about... I'm. I'm going to build this private community so we can talk about yeah. tearing down silos. Yeah, let, us, let me build a silo. <laughs> that, that nags at me a, a little bit. That it's like, you know, you keep saying we all need to be collaborative and learning and social. So we're going to go set up yet one more space. So we got to go talk about that. I, I, I see some people, it, it's evident back to what I was saying about my research, that people have this identity of I'm going to be the expert and the leader. Right. Rather than a contributor. And we can stop. That's the, the bat phone for my mother-in-law. Can you talk to us a little bit about the um, areas of research that you would like the Learning Guild to go for, but perhaps aren't on your uh, plate currently? You know, they've been open to whatever I've suggested, and sometimes we you know, tie things to an event that's coming up, like Julie Dirksen is doing a... Uh, the, the April report will be about designing for AR, VR, and then our June event is the Realities Conference in San Jose. But usually when I throw something out, they're, they're up for it right now. I'm just now finishing the uh, uh, working on a report on accessibility. And my interest in accessibility is not so much about the standards and the guidelines and the codes so much as how we can meet the needs of all our users. You know, it comes from all my years working with the population at the, at the Hospital for Develop People mm -hmm. with Developmental Disabilities. When I was with the e-learning the e job, we had the schools for the blind, the schools for the deaf, Voc Rehab, there's a library for the blind. We had any number of employees with different challenges. I had low literacy uh, issues with some of our workers. So I've always been very interested in how we can just make things more available to everybody. And, uh, and so accessibility has always, always been of interest to me, and, and I was the one that wanted to do that. And that includes interviews with Brian Dusablon and Nick Floro and Jean Maripodi and a woman from Penn State 
who works with uh, all of their online courses. So that's been a really interesting thing to pursue. I wanted to do learning styles. I don't know who said it first, but <laughs> I think I might have been the one to say it first. I would like to do a lit review on personality types. Yes. And I think that I will. Um, I will say when I did the, the report on learning styles, can I talk about this? Sure. I don't have kids. You, know, you and I have talked about mm -hmm. learning styles for a long time. I don't have kids. I had no idea the foothold that the stuff about learning styles has in the K-12 world. I had no idea how ingrained it is down to the kindergarten level. And when you think about I mean, it makes sense. You've got principals and you've got school administrators who want to say, we love your child and we're going to tailor instruction to your child. And mm -hmm. we're going to da, 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 da. You have parents who desperately want to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. I think it's on the parent side mostly that drives. And they want to hear. And so somehow this is the easiest way to say we're accommodating your, your kid or that, that we're meeting this need. Is that they've got, there's three learning styles. We're going to meet, meet it. Um, I had no idea the amount of money. I'm aware of the amount of money behind some of the personality type stuff and some mm -hmm. of the ethics therein. I had no idea about the commercialization of learning styles, instruments, workshops, professional development for teachers, the pressure on them to speak this language. You know, even if they don't believe in it or like it, they got parents demanding yeah, it. Right. So, you know, it, a lot of stuff with that was very eye-opening for me. I, I, it, it, the literature itself about this is what the experimentation says and this is what the, the hypothesis says and mm -hmm. this is what the empirical literature. I knew that. You and I have talked. You've written, written about that too. But I had no idea the amount of commercialization and pressure on people to use it. And I have a feeling I'm going to find the same about learning style, I mean about personality. personality types. And I don't know if you've heard this story, Clark Quinn tells it, and so I, it, I've quoted him. Clark's most recent book was about um, dispelling myths, it's the, right. the goldfish book, right. goldfish in the title. Mm -hmm. And it's a great little piece, I mean he's got these, you know, the, the, he, he proposes the myth, why people like it, how to respond, very quick, kind of quick and dirty. He was presenting on that at a big event, I don't, I don't know which one, I really don't know which one. There was a vendor Right. from that event who was in his audience who wrote on the evaluation that if Clark Quinn was it, it, he wasn't going to pay to exhibit there again if Clark Quinn was allowed to just debunk the thing he was selling mm -hmm. so there's pressure from all sides to keep these things cooking and I, I have a feeling I'm gonna run into that when I go into personality types <laughs> You are. I just did one of these videos with uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark, uh, who was formerly at the University of Southern California, yeah, yeah, and he yeah. tells the story of uh, being invited in to talk to some of the big uh, uh, donors from the alumni, and uh, that he berated a, one of the personality type instruments specifically, and didn't realize that one of the people he was talking to was, and he was never invited back to talk to these groups again yeah. because it because of the monetization of yeah. this. I, I have found that the people who defend personality types are making money on it in some way. That's mm -hmm. that's really, you know, the only people I know who defend it very much. But uh, but I'd like to pursue that. I, On a more general note about, about research, one of the things I talk about, one of the things I'm trying to do in this job is to help people understand research, how to find it, how to read it, how to make a little bit of sense of it, understanding some of the challenges of it. And one of the biggest challenges our industry has is that so much of the literature that we depend on is coming out of higher ed. Right. That more often than not, the people doing anything in the way of experimentation, any kind of experimental research, they're using college undergraduates. Mm -hmm. It's the convenience sample, yeah. and I don't blame them, or, or it's student teachers, somebody like that. Um, I don't know that a 20-year-old college sophomore is it is a good representation of a 40-year-old factory work. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would like to see more experimental literature coming out of the the adult work world, but the problems with that are enormous. You know, the organizations don't want to let you in. Their people have to be at work. They want access to and perhaps rights to change the data before yeah. it's put. There are a lot of problems. That's why so many of my friends ended up doing dissertations research at schools and not in their workplaces. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get the access and the time you need, and I get that, but I, I, I wish we could find a little bit more or, or see a little bit more research from um, workplace and not just so many from, um, from college. You know, the college kid's job is to go to school. Right.
<laughs> and they are not representative and, of the, of the um, vast uh, I, majority of I, I wrote other about, folks. I wrote about that, but I was at, um, last year when we were in San Jose for Realities, I went over to the, um, the medical school has a VR lab, and they were, in, they were asking for volunteers to participate in a study. Now this involved, I was doing this just sort of as a field trip from work. I mean, I needed, I was getting, it was fine for me to go do this, but it was basically when all was said and done, a half a day to drive over to Stanford, to park a car, to get in, to da 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 to do this thing, to get, and they gave me $8 in a t-shirt <laughs> for my payment for this. A college sophomore will take that and yeah. think it's a really, you know, you can't get many adults to spend half a day to drive to a big college campus because it's a VR lab. They can't bring it to you. You've got to go right. there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, uh, it's interesting um, when you think about where, what incentives there are, uh, thinking about people that, you know, they have the same problem recruiting people for uh, medical for studies. Yes. You know figuring out how that they can get it to rural populations, figuring out how it can, you know. Scaling it, right. Scaling it that way. So, um, so I, I don't know that I have topics in particular in mind, but when we start talking about things like the effectiveness of VR for firefighters or the effectiveness of AR for insurance inspectors, mm -hmm. I'd like to work with some actual firefighters or VR or insurance inspectors, right. and that's just harder to do. So you're going to be doing one research study per month? Mostly that's what I've been doing. Okay. Yeah, we have a topic a month. That's a, it seems like uh, you're going to go through the wor our world quickly, um, you know, a year or two. I don't, I don't know. know. They've been doing this for 10 years. Okay. So, but at that at that pace, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not been yeah, well, there's, that. there's traditionally been a salary survey. Okay. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, and there are always emerging topics. There's mm -hmm. we probably need to, you know, things in the in our world, especially the e-learning guilds world, change. It's probably time soon to look at game of games again, yeah. gamification again. It's going to be time to look at micro learning soon. It's probably going to be time to um, to take a look at um, ecosystems. Okay. We had a big hit last year with. Um, learning platforms. There's a shift now from just the LMS to other things. Mm -hmm. And that's going to evolve pretty quickly. Yeah. So stuff stuff changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the lit reviews probably won't know. We probably don't need to do learning styles again for a while, but some of the other the other topics we do. I you think need that, to hit on that learning styles every quarter or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's just saying this, the big stuff <laughs> yeah. on learning styles were done in two thousand four and nobody's listening. Um, yeah. So uh, Ellen Wagner is going to be doing something on learning engineering for us. I think that's that's mm -hmm. a topic we're going to see get more conversation. I think we need more people who can interpret the language around big data and anal analytics. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably, you know, so there's always yeah, cool. stuff. Yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to yeah. learning. Yeah. Um, so as a kind of a wrap to our interview here, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, particularly people new to the field, uh, related to all things learning and performance improvement? What would your guidance be for them? I have one thing to say. I say it a lot. I don't know that I'm the first person who said it. I won't take credit. But I think our job, ultimately, finally, all the time, is that we need to consider not how we can teach it, but how they can learn it and what they need to do with it once they do learn it. So, you know, that that is where I think our focus needs to be. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for sure. doing this interview. Sure. I'm going to say, for those of you who picked up on the nose rubbing, apparently we finally have pollen in Durham, North Carolina, <laughs> and I'm sorry. Spring is here. Spring Yay. is here. Spring is sprung. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh.